Ditto has become one of the most iconic Pokemon around, and that's not simply due to its interesting battle gimmick or cute demeanor, but rather as the centerpiece and one of the game's most important mechanics, as Ditto's ability to transform lets it produce eggs with the majority of Pokemon, leading the little guy to quickly become a necessity for creating the perfect Pokemon to compete at the highest levels of the game, as well as hatching that elusive shiny. So with all that demand on Ditto's shoulders, how tough is it to track down this Master of Disguise? Well, that's what we are going to uncover today by seeing just how fast you can get a Ditto in every Pokemon game. Now, finding all these Dittos is not going to be an easy task, and while we can't have Ditto simply transform into a freshly cooked meal to replenish our strength, today's sponsor, Factor 75, has our backs. Factor 75 provides delicious, ready-to-eat meals right to your door. These fresh, never-frozen meals are chef-crafted, dietitian approved and ready-to-eat in just two minutes, way faster than any of our challenges. And with a weekly menu of more than 30 different meals that cover a variety of options like Calorie Smart, Keto, Protein Plus, or Vegan and Veggie, you will always be excited for your next. Plus, Factor doesn't just do meals, as they now offer delicious snacks, smoothies, juices, and more to help fit anyone's schedule. Personally, I love the speed at which I can get a variety of meal options without even needing to leave my home, and all with zero cleanup, saving me tons of time which comes in handy when planning out or taking on the next daunting challenge. And on top of all this, you can support the channel by using my link and subscribing to Factor. Get 50% off your first Factor box and 20% off your next month of orders using my link in the description or scan the QR code on screen. Opening with Ditto's home of Kanto, we actually have some version differences to discuss. First, Red and Blue have five different locations to encounter our transforming target, but two of these require further game progression than the rest. Route 23 with badge checks plus surfing, and Cerulean Caves strictly in the post-game. The rest though are actually all right next to each other on routes 13, 14, and 15. Meanwhile, Yellow Version removes Ditto from all prior routes and only adds it to the Pokemon Mansion, thus requiring Surf as well. However, a fun fact here is that Japan's Blue Version did add a few new encounters, one being a 10% Ditto in Rock Tunnel. So if you can play that blue, it will be fastest, but otherwise we stick to routes 13 through 15, which have ditto encounters at 5, 15, and 15% 15 respectively. Now, all of these could utilize a repel trick to boost Ditto's encounter rate, but the majority of other spawns will still be present, and turning the trick on wouldn't be convenient either. Thus, we will stick to the standard rates, and with that in mind, Route 13 will be a no-go, as although there are only two mandatory trainers before we make it there, we have two more right at its start before we even reach Ditto's grass. Alternatively, going through Fuchsia to Route 15 requires no mandatory trainers at all, meaning this will be our answer, as 14 would require a bit more walking and a cut use. The only questions left revolve around catching Ditto, and although there have been lots of discussion online about which games have Ditto's catch rate transform along with it, that is not the case in Gen 1, meaning we are stuck with a relatively low and unique catch rate of 35, leaving us to determine which ball to use as we can grab either Great Balls in our department store trip or spend some extra time in Fuchsia for Ultra Balls. However, Gen 1 has some very unintuitive design here specifically being that Great Balls will be better than Ultras in many scenarios, particularly when our Mon is above 50% HP, thus it will be better to stick with Great Balls during our shopping trip needing 5 on average to make the catch. Meaning once we get the Poke Flute and can bike down to Fuchsia, we simply search around in the first patch of grass on Route 15, attack once to double our odds, and start throwing until we get our first ditto of the run. The second generation gives Ditto a very fitting home, right next to the newly introduced daycare on Route 34, but at a lowly 5%. And there is a lot less version discussion here, with the only consideration being that Crystal will be about 20 seconds ahead at this point due to some differences in mandatory battles. Now Ditto can also be found on Route 35 at about the same rate, 4%. In both locations, they are found at the lowest levels encounterable, meaning there won't be any repel tricking here. 
Further, either route has the same rate of encountering wild mons at 10% per step. Thus, with Route 35 being further away and riddled with trainers, 34 will always be optimal. Regardless, we will want to grab the bike to speed up the time between encounters and stop in the nearby Goldenrod Mart to grab as many Great Balls as possible, since it's our best option at this point to handle the low catch rate. Then we bike back and forth until eventually finding our target, hitting it once and making our next catch of the run. Except there is one more trick we need to consider, the radio. Because while in Goldenrod, we can stop in the radio tower, answer five quick questions, and get the radio card, giving us access to a variety of channels, but specifically the always live Pokemon Music channel, which plays the Pokemon March four days a week. And this tune doubles the encounter rate to 20% per step. Now with a base 10% grass rate, an encounter takes an average of 10 steps or 1.25 seconds, versus the March's rate of five steps or 0.625 seconds. With Ditto being a 5% encounter, it will take 20 attempts on average to find one, thus it would take the standard rate about 25 seconds of overworld time, versus the March's 12.5 seconds. And this gives us a solid answer since getting the radio card and turning on the tunes takes longer than the expected time save at around a minute, meaning we can stick to the normal bike music, catch our ditto, and march on with the rest of the challenge. Generation 3 gives us our first case of a ditto removal, as Ruby and Sapphire can only get them on through trade, removing ditto from the region itself. However, Emerald does remedy this, bringing ditto into Hoenn, but only after becoming the champion, at which point Birch immediately rewards us with a national dex, and we can head to the Ruin Maniac's house and access the Desert Underpass, where ditto has the highest encounter rate we have seen so far at 50% meaning we have to follow the speedrun all the way to the Pokemon League, spend our money on Ultra Balls, then let Rayquaza finish the rest of the story. However, there is something we need to consider, as before starting the League, a speedrun deposits the rest of their team in order to speed up the Hall of Fame cutscenes, since a run doesn't end until the credits. Now, the team deposit is seemingly fine, as Rayquaza has taught Fly for the endgame and thus could get us to Ditto. But in this generation, Ditto actually does copy the Transform Mon's catch rate. Meaning if we only have Rayquaza and don't make the first 9% attempt catch, a fake Quaza has a 0.83% chance per ball, slowing things down drastically. But there is a simple solution here. We keep our team for the Elite Four, especially because the Manipolis run we follow catches Swablu as the original flyer, which has the highest catch rate possible, the perfect target for Ditto's transform. And furthermore, we are actually gaining time by doing this, because as soon as we get to the Hall of Fame and the game finishes saving, we can immediately soft reset to return home rather than watching the team and reaching the credits. The only new time loss this introduces is less than a second due to the three extra Pokeballs being registered but this is far better than the close to 10 required to deposit the team, even without mentioning a Rayquaza capture. Thus, after returning home and getting the national decks from Birch, we can fly to Fall Arbor Town to enter the Desert Underpass, where Ditto's 50% encounter rate makes the Repel trick and terrain rates unnecessary to transform here. So after finding our Ditto, we swap to Swablu as the transform target to take our catching odds from 9% to a solid 78%. And after our first full journey through Hoenn, we end up with the easiest catch so far. But real quick, if you are enjoying this or any of the previous catching challenges, subscribing would help a ton in supporting the series. Plus, if we make it to 50k subscribers, I will start working on how fast can you catch a shiny in every game. Okay, now let's find out how we tackle the most complex run in the entire series. Generation 4 continues a trend started in Hoenn, by locking Ditto encounters behind the national decks. Interestingly, this does not actually require us to beat the game in order to unlock, but the requirement is much more time consuming, demanding we see every Mon in the base Sinnoh decks before getting the upgrade. And while seeing a Pokemon is far easier than catching it, we still need to route an optimal path through a total of 150 specific Pokemon in order to make this happen in the base games, which is at least better than Platinum's 60 additional entries to find, but we still need to decide between Diamond and Pearl. As we learned last time, Pearl would be the game of choice since Palkia is the fastest endgame carry available, but then how far do we have to progress to complete our mission? Well, because there are no story progression checks for the national decks at all, we will need to determine if there is a point at which we stop and focus solely on the deck entries. Luckily though, there's an easy answer, as the Elite Four contains not only a handful of encounters that can't be battled prior to this point, but the champion synth 
Cynthia has three particular Pokemon we would need, Spiritomb, Garchomp, and Milotic, any of which would take far longer to encounter or evolve into than simply following the speedrun through the league. However, since we don't need to win a battle in order to get a dex entry, the optimal amount of progression is reaching Cynthia's third Pokemon we need to see, after which we lose the battle since it's faster than winning and watching the victory scene. With that knowledge, I reviewed every encounter across a Manipolis speedrun to find a total of 118 dex entries along the way. And all of this also solves the version question, since we need Palkia to reach Cynthia fastest. And those 118 mons cover every version exclusive aside from one irrelevant technicality, and the other box legend, which Cynthia's grandma would need to show you in either game. Thus, we can now move on to planning a route for the 32 Pokémon we are missing. Generally, this is broken into two questions. Where and when is it best to find each of these? For a few Pokémon, the answers are relatively simple. Unknown, for example, is only seen in the Salacian Ruins, and since the run passes through here just twice, we will need to choose one of those visits to do the encounter, with the faster choice being the first, since our Repel will already be down, due to catching a B-Barrel right beforehand. The next easiest to cover would be the rest of the Legends, as we just need to visit each lake and run from their respective tree member. Now for Uxi up at Lake Acuity, we can do this after either escape roping out of Mount Cornet post Palkia or taking our loss to Cynthia. The latter I prefer as we would need to pick back up our flyer, at which point swapping Palkia for Infernape removes the pressure ability triggers from any remaining encounters. Following this, Mesperit at Lake Verity is an optimal final dex entry if possible. Not simply because it's funny to have Rowan tell us about Mesperit running off and then meet in the lab right after for the upgrade, but rather the the fly menuing between Lake Verity and Sanjum is likely faster than any other final dex entry we could have. And Azelf at Lake Valor is a given, as we already will be heading past here on our way to Sunny Shore, giving the perfect chance to swing by. Also, we still need to stop in Celestic for Cynthia's grandma to show us Dialga, and similar to the Mesperit logic, flying back to Celestic is best done right before flying to the northernmost city, Snowpoint, for that Uxie visit. Now there are a few more unique but evident cases to cover before the rest. Kicking off with Riolu, whose only method for obtaining is on the non-mandatory Iron Island after teaming up with Riley and taking down two double battles that have 11 Pokemon in total in order to receive a Riolu egg. And across those 11 Pokemon, only one would be a new dex entry, Haunter, who we will cover after finishing up Riolu's options as there is only one trainer in the game that features it, located a bit out of the way in the basement of Orberg Gate across the water. But we could add this trip in before climbing Mount Cornet, quickly heading down to defeat the trainer who also has a free Graveler we need before escaping out and getting back on the path, taking about 2 minutes and 30 seconds. Now for obtaining a Haunter, a ghastly evolution is out of the question, as the highest level we can catch it is 7 levels away from evolution, before even mentioning the animation time. Further, any Haunter encounters are locked in the post game, leaving just the infamous Mindy trade in Snowpoint, which ironically saves time since it won't evolve due to the Everstone, but would not at all beat out the available trainers, as there are 6 in total before the post game, including the previously mentioned Iron Island double. Now one of these trainers has only a Haunter found in Hardhome Gym, and although the next best option is right along our path on Route 214 with only an extra Kadabra, the gym encounter is close enough and still a one-shot to Flame Wheel that it wins by 10 seconds. So even when timing from the point of teaming up with Riley to the Egg, battling the gym and gate trainers saves over 3 minutes while providing an additional Graveler, meaning we can stay out of Iron Island or at least avoid the Riley section, because a Pokemon in the remaining trio of vanilla cases may require visiting the island, and that would be Cherim, one of three evolutions that can only be seen in battle or by evolution. But catching their pre-evolutions is not an option, as we will discuss in the next section, and even then would require no less than five levels. So back to Cherim, there is one other trainer, but they are over on the unexplored Route 221, with two additional Pokemon, neither of which we need. And compared to a post-gym boat ride, Trip down one floor and single extra Staravia, this Iron Island route actually ends up being faster by around 20 seconds, giving us our entry. Luckily, Burmese evolutions are even easier, as both Wormadam and Motham have only a single trainer each, the prior being right along our path on Route 214 as Beauty Devon's sole Pokemon, and the latter on Route 210 also along our path, with Ace Trainer Ernest accompanied by two unneeded Pokemon. But for both battles, we will have the additional PP needed when following 
following the speedrun, wrapping up our more simple entries. Now from here, the rest of the Pokémon can be encountered either in the wild or from at least one trainer, and since a Pokémon's location is not necessarily correlated to that of its corresponding trainers, many of these will require extra comparisons. So to start, we can break the encounters into four categories, standard terrain, fishing, honey trees, and overworld. Luckily, one of these, the honey tree encounters alluded to earlier, aren't up for consideration, since it takes six real-life hours to have a chance at a Pokémon and even then the encounter rates are not favorable. No worries though, as Combi and Burmy each have only one trainer in the entire game, both right along our path, those being Aroma Lady Hannah on Route 208 and Bugcatcher Donald in Eterna Forest, whose one extra mon is Cricktoon, which fills in another missing entry. Plus, these battles still don't require any additional consideration since we will have the necessary PP to one-shot in both and a routed heal in Hardhome as well as Cheryl's auto-heal in Eterna leaving us with the most complicated of this honey trio, Apom, who has four trainers to compare. The easiest to rule out is right in the middle of the long route 212, a Pokemon Ranger who has the monkey and an unnecessary Meryl. Similarly, at the start of Route 210, Rancher Marco can also be battled, but has two useless encounters. And while Marco is right along our path, the remaining two options have additional dex entries up for grabs, or at least can in the case of Wayward Cave's youngster Wayne, who has Apom and, again, two time wasters, but can be made a double battle with Cassidy, who has a single Baneri, which we are looking for. Whereas the final Apom option is a double battle in Valor Lakefront's Seven Stars Restaurant, which includes only one other unneeded Mon in Merrill, and provides us our missing Wooper. With the restaurant being right along our path at multiple points, we can easily rule out Rancher Marco, but we need to see if that Baneri is worth the trek into Wayward Cave, compared to the Wooper we could get at Seven Stars. Interestingly, we do visit all possible locations to capture either, those being Eterna Forest for Veneri and the Great Marsh or Route 212 South for Wooper. Veneri sits at the lowest base encounter rate at 19%, but thanks to Cheryl being with us for the double battles, the odds go up to 34%, and that is already higher than any Wooper encounters in the grass, which cap at 30%, with surfing being the only way to increase this, but at the heavy cost of an extra trip back after getting the HM. And this means that a free Wooper with our APOM is slightly better than Veneri. But we also need to consider if there are any other trainers for either bonus mon that offers additional dex entries, and luckily, Veneri can otherwise only be found as the sole mon of a trainer out front of the Pokemon Mansion, while Wooper is in one other double battle at the Jubilife TV station on Thursdays, alongside the third useless Meryl mentioned. Thus, with the Wayward Cave and Seven Star Apom trainers both being the better choices for their bonus mon, and either one having a reasonable route to see in the wild or through said alternative trainer, the Seven Star battle is the better choice since it is quicker to get to. However, this restaurant doesn't always have the same customers, as only five of the nine pairs are randomly selected to appear each day. But this does give us a 55% shot, and if not, we can reset our game and change the date, giving us an 80% chance by the second attempt. Since it only takes 44 seconds to save and make the time change, as shown in the current All Trainers world record, the seven-star restaurant is a worthwhile risk, as it takes just as long to reach the Wayward Cave trainers anyways. On top of all that, we can even save the battle, until after we have Palkia, who will have excess Dragon Claws to easily sweep the battle. But while we still have the game's date in our minds, let's cover the single overworld encounter that relies on it. Drifloon. As you might recall from the Ghost video, this missing entry can be spotted on the overworld outside of the Valley Wind Works on Fridays, after kicking out Team Galactic, but not on a Friday that you beat the team. Thus, a date change would always be required to see a wild Drifloon. But there are of course trainers, two to be precise, and fittingly both in Hardhome Gym. The first has a Drifloon and a Mischievous, while the second has two Drifloon, making the prior better as we need to use Flame Wheels to save Fire Blast while still one shotting, and this triggers Drifloon's aftermath, which takes HP and time. In the end, the optimal battle is just slightly faster than the Windworks encounter, and although we know a date change may be necessary for the Seven Stars restaurant, doing it before we get to check the customers provides no benefit anyways. So we can stick with the extra EXP and move on to the second to last encounter type. Fishing. In total, we have five Pokemon that can be fished up. Magikarp, Goldeen, Barboach, Finneon, and Luminion. That final 
final one requires the super rod specifically though, which is locked in the post game, meaning we need either the single Lumineon trainer, a swimmer right along our path on Route 223, or to evolve the Finneon. But since its max level in the wild with a good rod is 25 and it evolves at 31, this is always slower than the battle, leaving us with four actual fishing options to discuss. Now oppositely, Magikarp can be fished up at any fishing location in Sinnoh, and although it only needs an old rod, the other three need a good rod. And while each can be found in a variety of locations, the trio do not have any overlapping fishing spots. Fortunately, in many of these spots, the only other spawn alongside the unique target is Magikarp, and at a 45-55% split respectively. On top of that, the good rod is only a few steps off our path on Route 209, and we will actually surf on at least one location that has each Pokemon at this rate across the run. Those being any of the lakes when visiting the Lake Trio for Goldeen, our surf across Route 218 to reach Canale for Finneon, and perfectly, the Orberg Gates Underground Lake for Barboach, which we visit for that Riolu trainer. Thus, fishing requires no added travel for the entries. However, we still need to consider trainers, especially since there are 21 in total that have at least one of the four. Of these, Finneon and Barboach can only be found in combination with one of the other two fish, that being Goldeen for Barboach and Magikarp for Finneon, meaning we would need at least two battles. There are also multiple trainers with these combinations, but there is a clear winner in both cases. For Barboach and Goldeen, the fish on Route 212's bridge with no extra Pokemon is too far a detour, compared to Pastoria Gyms who is as close to our path as possible, leaving their additional Gyarados not a problem. And for Finneon and Magikarp, Route 221's far-off Fisher Cory can't match the pair of Fishers right along our path through Route 222, with the second being optimal since it only adds a Feebas rather than the first Remoraid and Gyarados. So we can now compare the time it takes to complete the two battles, about 2 minutes and 38 seconds, against the time to fish up the four in their respective locations, about 1 minute and 54 seconds, suggesting the latter to be optimal. However, that fishing time shows if we were to get each encounter on our first attempt. For example, if we got Magikarp as our first encounter, we would then need to hit three 45% rolls back to back, which only has a 9% chance. This is before even considering that fishing itself isn't always successful, having a 50% chance with the good rod, giving us only a 6.25% chance to hit four encounters in a row. Thus, it will almost always be faster to stick with battling the trainers instead of fishing. Now, on to the last encounter category, Standard Terrain. And to start, let's finalize the Beniri entry, because we could still go for either the Eterna Encounter or Solo Trainer on Route 212. While we have a 34% chance per encounter in Eterna, that 212 Trainer actually has another benefit we haven't discussed, because on our trip over, we can find one of two Chadot Trainers in the game, the other being in Jubilife TV on Mondays, but both with the Parrot as their only Mon and being preferable over the best wild encounter in Route 222's grass at just 20%. So after returning to Hardhome for the gym, if we head to 212 for the trainers, we can get both entries and return to the route in 1 minute and 50 seconds, a bit better than the expected 8 total encounters, about 2 minutes and 8 seconds to see both. And while we are outside the Pokemon Mansion, the Trophy Garden actually features a majority of the encounters left to find. But while Pichu and Pikachu can always be seen, Bonsai, Mime Jr., Happini, and Cleffa are only available as potential additions after obtaining the national decks. Even more, Pikachu and Pichu only have a 10 and at best 30% rate, respectively. And while half of these Pokemon can be encountered in other locations, the other half cannot, thus requiring trainers. Although technically, Hapini can be hatched from the free egg. But if we take a look at the only two Hapini trainers, both include some of these other mons, and are found on Route 210, with Breeder Khalil having Pichu, Pikachu, and Hapini, while Breeder Amber has Cleffa, Hapini, and a of course, an unnecessary Clefairy. Between the two, Khalil is more useful and removes any trophy garden requirements, leaving us to deal with the other three and, perfectly, again on Route 210 as well as 209, we can find the other location of both Bonsai and Mime Jr., each at a 25% rate in the mornings. However, outside of the garden, these are technically version exclusives, meaning a trainer would be required for at least Bonsai. And we have the perfect one, as right after the Combi trainer on 208, the nearby artist has not only Bonsai, but also Mime Jr., providing the complementary Mon for free. Thus, Cleffa is the final trophy-adjacent target to handle, with an alternate encounter location specifically in Mount Cornet's first floor at 25% in the mornings. And while we pass through these specific rooms at 
points in the run, the time spent there is brief and caves already have a low encounter rate. Now on the trainer side, while we know about Amber on 210 with Hippini, there is another breeder on 209 that has Cleffa, Mime Jr., and an unneeded Badoo. So choosing either of these over the encounter is not as quick since we already have a better route for those entries. However, there is one more Cleffa trainer that's not only right along our path in the Lost Tower, but has no other Pokemon to waste time on, taking just 37 seconds, about the length of two random encounters, which is only a 44% success rate, making this trainer the best bet, leaving us with just two stragglers. First, Cricketot, who has a variety of encounter spots, but always at a low 10% rate. Luckily, there is a youngster on Route 203 with a sole Cricketot that is an option for the speedrun already, as we need to take on a few trainers before the first gym to evolve Chimchar. So finally, we have Tentacool, who appears in 12 bodies of water, always at a favorable 60% rate. Unsurprisingly, we do surf on one of these during the run, Route 218, on our way to Conalave. And this is far better than either of the two trainers, with one on the explored Route 220 including two extra mons, and the other on our final route, but oddly out of the way in this corner along with an unneeded duck, meaning we can simply leave our rappel down until after we find a tentacool on 218, which ends up being the only truly random encounter of the 32 dex entries we need. But somehow, there is still one critical detail we have yet to resolve. One that impacts not only the speed at which Palkia can carry us through the endgame, but also whether some of our planned entries are optimal or even possible, and that is the time of day. In terms of Palkia, we need to pick up the choice specs, a held item which boosts special attack by 50% while locking the holder into one move, but this item can only be obtained from a Celestic Shop NPC in the morning. More important to our goal though, the Seven Stars Restaurant, our best route to get Apom and a free Wooper, opens at 9am, leaving only an hour until the glasses disappear. Of course, there is a solution. We simply play early enough to get the specs, but late enough that it is past 9 when heading towards Seven Stars with Palkia. For this, 6am will suffice as it only takes the world record 2 hours and 18 minutes to get the glasses and no less than 3 hours to have Palkia. And since our pre-Palkia dex entries will not add anywhere near the 1 hour and 42 minutes that would take us past morning, we are all set and the national dex route is finalized. So, after following the Manipla speedrun up to Cynthia's Milotic while grabbing 29 of the entries along the way, we simply head for a Dialga pick and two legendary escapes before returning to the lab and receiving our upgrade. But the National Dex wasn't really the end goal. In fact, you can get traded non Sinnoh Dex Pokémon in these games even without it. Rather, after receiving the Dex upgrade, Rowan gives us the Poker Radar, which is what we actually need for encountering Ditto over on Route 218. Now it's worth pointing out that this is different from Platinum's post-nat dex ditto, which instead needs Mr. Backlot's Trophy Garden and a 1 in 16 chance per soft reset to add ditto, and even then is just a 5% encounter before even recalling that 40% dex increase. But that said, there is, of course, one caveat to the poker radar, as not all shaking grass patches have ditto. We specifically need the patches with three jumping leaves to find the radar unique Pokemon, with ditto at a 12% rate. So we will reset the radar for any failed encounters or missing ditto grass, but that is simple enough and still much faster than anything Platinum has to deal with, leaving the final question being the actual catch, which thankfully is relatively simple with a guaranteed outcome, as while we again no longer have a Master Ball, we can easily stop at the right league vendor for a single repeat ball, which has a 100% success rate after ditto transforms into Starly, because Gen 4 is the second and final time ditto also copies the target's catch rate, and since we already needed Starly for Fly after our loss, all we need to do is radar until ditto, swap to Starly on the transform, and then guarantee a catch with our repeat ball, ending what is by far the most difficult run we have tackled to date. Okay, now to cover any differences in the remakes for completion's sake. Starting off in Fire Red and Leaf Green, which remains the same as Red, with the best options being on routes 13 through 15. However, there is funnily a new optimal choice between the three, as only Route 14 has the 15% ditto, while both 13 and 15 have the lowly 5%. And although the spread of levels are a bit different than Gen 1, the Repel Tricks still won't change the results, since routes 13 and 15 only get boosted to 10%, which is still slower than the base 15% rate on Route 14, meaning that even with a slightly longer trip and cut tree, Route 14 will actually be the better choice here. 
But moving on to a more interesting case with Heart Gold and Soul Silver, not because Ditto has been added to the new Route 47 in Safari Zone, along with an OG return to Cerulean Cave, as its earliest appearance remains on Route 34 at 5%. Instead, the radio is actually a bit more complicated than before, because although the Pokemon March does still lead to an increase in the encounter rate, Bulbapedia states it increases the movement rate of the formula by 25, and nowhere does it mention what the encounter formula is. However, thanks to all the incredible speedrunners of the DS games and their discussions, things start to get a bit more clear. In these games, two passes must be cleared to generate an encounter, the first based on the movement rate, mentioned before, and the second being the location rate. The latter is what we are used to in prior games, a specific rate that is variable based on the location and type of terrain. But the first check is based on your movement type, with walking, running, or biking each having a unique base rate for the check, which is where the radio comes into play, providing a 25 point boost to this first pass. And while nice, it doesn't quite stack up to the original radio since we still need to pass that location check. Even more, while on the bike, the movement rate is already 70, and can be up to a perfect 100 by simply performing two opposite direction movements, as this also increases the rate. In that case, the radio only impacts your encounter odds before you max your movement rate, and thus is even less useful. But we can keep this knowledge on hand for future challenges, and instead deal with a remake that actually does change things up, because although Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire do not simply add in Emerald's Ditto location, upon completing the main story events, Steven gives us the Eon Flute, letting us soar through the skies with our Lottie, and this gives us access to the new Mirage spots, and a Ditto can be found in exactly two, a cave or island north and south of Route 132 respectively, keeping a solid encounter rate of 40%. However, there is an issue as we only get one random Mirage spot per day. Now there is another way to get spots, specifically by connecting to Wi-Fi, since enough passerbys in the PSS can generate more spots, and these can be re-rolled by resetting. But since Wi-Fi is now shut down for the 3DS, our only hope is to change the console's date forward as a replacement. Except this won't actually work on console, because if the 3DS clock is changed, time-based events will not occur for 24 hours, which includes Mirage spots meaning we're out of luck. Thus, I will provide a hypothetical time for this portion, using an estimate for how long it would take if we could connect to Wi-Fi and generate enough players for a spot, then adding in a fly up, check for the ditto spots, and soft reset, taking about a minute and a half per attempt. Since the average number of resets we need to find either spot among the 32 is 16, this should add about 24 minutes post the legendary cutscene. Putting this aside, we will be playing on Omega Ruby, as it's both the current faster game overall, and about 2 minutes ahead after finishing the grout on. Speaking of the legend, we don't need to capture it for our purposes, and although we can't simply run away, we can knock it out. Sadly, due to Primal Groudon's desolate land ability, Surf does nothing, but we can instead use X specials to make Luster Purge a two-shot on the monster, letting us save the Master Ball to help make up for the fact that Ditto and the Mirage Spot Pokemon are likely some of the hardest non-event Pokemon to now obtain on your own. But this leaves us with Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, and as you might expect, the goal would be the exact same as before, the National Vex. There is at least an additional Ditto location at that point though, with the Grand Underground's Dazzling Cave or Stargleam Cavern. At first, the odds of finding it weren't particularly clear, since most resources don't list the exact odds of any Pokemon here, and that is because setting up statues in your home base influences these rates depending on the statue's type. But luckily, over in the Speedrun's Discord, Salt Container created a fantastic spreadsheet to efficiently summarize this information, revealing that Ditto has a 2.53% chance to spawn in Pearl. And in the larger Stargleam Cavern, we find between 7 and 10 spawns per room check, meaning Ditto has a 16.4 to 22.6% chance to appear, which is already better than the still low 12% chance of the radar, which is actually now even worse since the radar specific mons have a 20% chance to not even be used. On top of all this, the initial underground trip and cutscene are forced earlier in the game, so there's no additional time loss to worry about. Thus, the new underground ditto would be the way to go if you do decide to take your Sinnoh Dex adventure to the Switch. Wrapping up our coverage of the remakes for this challenge. 
Finally, moving to a new region with Unova, both the base games and sequels find Ditto in the Giant Chasm at 15%. And while this is a post-game location in the prior, the sequels actually visit here about 2 hours and 40 minutes in, making it our game of choice. But there is another decision to be made, and that isn't regarding the 1% chance to find Ditto in the Hidden Grotto. Rather, the question is between trying for a Repel trick or not. As although our lead will be far beyond Ditto's level here, 30% of the encounters are one level away from turning a trick on. All we would need is to make a quick stop for a rare candy in the corner of Village Bridge, purchase a quick ball during the shopping mall trip, and have a level 46 encounter before Ditto in order to take our 15% encounter odds all the way up to a 50-50, which only adds a minute and a half. But sadly, with as quick as this is, the base odds would on average find Ditto by the 7th encounter, or about 1 minute and 40 seconds. Thus, even in the best case scenario of finding a 46 Mammoth Swine on the first encounter and making the 59% quick ball catch, we would still only have a 50-50 shot to match the expected non-repel time. Now, a level 48 Matang can also turn the trick on immediately, but it's only a 5% encounter and has the catch rate of a legendary, thus requiring the Master Ball we would be saving for Ditto, which itself only has a 33% rate in a Quick Ball. But beyond this, it's worth noting that we could also repel trick in the Dark Grass, since it has an equal distribution of levels just a bit higher. However, it does have other downsides, as catching is made more difficult in this terrain depending on the number of caught Pokémon we have, taking our best odds for catching the repel trigger all the way down to 24%. Plus, there is a 40% chance to get a double battle, which would require us to knock out any additional mon for a catch, which slows down the trick further. Beyond this, the double battles could be beneficial to the non-repel search though, since each has a 28% chance for Ditto, and we can expect 2-3 to three of them across the average 7 regular grass encounters. But if it does appear in a double, even though we can quickly one-shot these higher level encounters, we would then need to sit through the rest of the turn, specifically the leveling of our second Mon if we couldn't use Earthquake to knock it out in the case of a lower level Ditto or Lunatone and Soul Rock with Levitate. Thus, even the benefits here do not readily beat Standard Grass, which is what I chose to stick with in the end, finding a Ditto on a not too bad ninth encounter and getting to use our first accurately timed Master Ball so far. The Gen 6 games again force us past the legendary encounter to find our transforming target, but not too much farther luckily, as upon finishing up with Xerneas and Lysander, all we need to do is complete a few more battles with Sycamore and the various friends before we can head through Snowbell City and into the Winding Woods, leading us straight to the Pokemon Village, where Ditto can be found in Yellow Flowers at a solid 20% rate, albeit without any Repel Trick possibilities. However, Ditto can also be found in Purple Flowers, and although only at 10%, level is at the max found in this terrain, letting a repel trick here boost it to 24.4%, a bit better than the yellow flowers. Even more, we would already have a Mon to turn on the trick, that being the legendary Xerneas, because although it would be faster to save our Master Ball and simply run away from the legend, we are forced to catch Xerneas to progress, thus the Master Ball needs to be used there for speed. But this means we could turn the repel trick on, except the only purple flowers in the village bridge are in the upper left corner of the area, requiring Waterfall to access, which we can't use until completing the final gym. Thus, we will stick to the 20% yellow flowers, with the only other note being what Pokeballs to use with the Master Ball gone. And the answer is thankfully simple, as both Quick and Dusk Balls can be purchased from the Snowbell City Mart, which we pass on our way to the village, letting us attempt a Quick Ball at full for a 33% chance, and otherwise follow up with Dusk Balls at 22 to make our next catch. The Alola games finally bring us back to a Ditto that is a bit earlier on, at least story progression wise, as Ditto can be found in either the base or ultra games on Mount Hakulani at a 10% rate, with the ultra games being behind by around 12 minutes here. However, Ultra Sun and Moon up the Ditto ante with what is likely the oddest scenario so far, because on Route 9 inside the police station, the officer at the back is actually a Ditto, specifically a member of the troublesome Ditto 5, and while that detail is meaningless to us, this event does provide a perfectly catchable Ditto 14 minutes faster than even the base games could. On top of that, we don't even need to waste our time prepping for the catch, since Kiawe gives us Quick Balls for completing their trial, which have a 33% shot, and can follow up with Great Balls gifted from the trainer school if needed. But luckily, we make our first Quick Ball catch of the challenge, and complete the simplest yet strangest run so far. 
Now for our final trip to Kanto, we can no longer rely on the classic routes 13 through 15, since these games are based on Yellow, which only had the Pokemon Mansion and post-game Cerulean Cave dittos. But since we don't need a badge to surf, we still only have to reach Fuchsia for the surf technique, the only thing we would need to head for the Pokemon Mansion. Here, Ditto is found at a 1% rate on floors 1 through 3, and a much better 10% in the basement. However, there is one obstacle in our way, a single trainer with two Pokemon at least 14 levels higher than our own. Thankfully, we can get an easy win by catching a Mon in the mansion itself, specifically any Raticate we see along our way. With it, we can use Hyper Fang, set up an X attack, and close out the single battle. After that, we simply keep lures going as we search the area, eventually finding our basement dwelling ditto, and making the catch with the best balls we have access to at this point to finish up our time in Kanto. Sword and Shield finally brings us back to a run with a variety of possibilities, having four in total, those being encounters in the Lake of Outrage or Workout Sea, and raid battles in the Stony Wilderness or Dynamax Adventures. This last one, while particularly fast as shown in DLC speedruns of these games, which get a Pokemon as early as 53 minutes in, have no way to guarantee a ditto out of the 226 possible encounters, nor can they simply reset since the first route is saved immediately. Oppositely though, the Stony Wilderness raids guarantee Ditto in the Rare Pool, which has a 12.5% chance to appear when using a Wishing Piece, and this process can be soft reset until we see the Rare Raid spawn. Now, although we can head over to this den as soon as we get to the Wild Area and collect enough Watts for a Wishing Piece, the Northern Dens are not active until we get the third badge, thus we will be comparing this with the two standard encounter locations. For those, both the Lake of Outrage and Workout Sea have the same base requirement, the Road on Bikes Water Mode, which requires playing all the way through the 6th gym and some extra events to obtain, taking the any% percent speedrun just over 2.5 hours, which is over an hour past the point we can freely access the raid area with our third badge. More than enough time to collect the watts we need for a single wishing piece, head over to the den, perform on average 4 minutes of soft resets, and finally complete the raid. However, we still need to determine which route to follow, as the Any% percent Sword speedrun uses the starter up to this point, while the DLC run we mentioned earlier takes a trip to the Crown Tundra's intro Dynamax adventure to grab a level 60 plus Mon as a carry for the rest of the game. While this route is interesting on its own, with a variety of different options for the raid catch that have beat the game faster than the non-DLC route, we just need to check which run reaches the post third gym wild area first, and sadly, despite that absurdly overleveled Mon, the DLC run is still behind by 8 minutes due to that trip, meaning we will stick to the any% percent route for our ditto, using Sobble to beat the first 3 gyms, grab our watts and wishing piece, then head for the den, getting surprisingly lucky with a rare raid on my first attempt, and then taking out ditto without dynamaxing since that takes longer than a turn 2 knockout anyways, finally ending the run with just a pokeball thanks to raids being a guaranteed catch, giving us the first run under 2 hours since gen 2. While we would normally be moving on to Legends Arceus, this game doesn't actually include the transforming target, despite its terrifyingly complex appearance in the region's future. Whether this was due to the lack of an egg system, time period, or some other choice, we get to jump over to our final games which do feature Ditto, Scarlet and Violet. Here, Ditto can be found in either West Province Area 2 and 3, or in 3 star and above Terra Raid battles. However, that specific rating requires at least 3 badges, and since fans of the series know we can hop across to South Prov 4 and run all the way to the West Provinces before even finishing the tutorial, the raids are not up for discussion. And while Area 2 and 3 have the exact same odds, 2 is strictly closer than 3 at this point, making it the ideal location. Furthermore, Dittos actually have three times higher probability for spawning in the town biome over the prairie, in this case being the area leading up to and around the lighthouse, and is thus where we will head to find our target. But with Pokemon now strictly spawning in the overworld, Ditto gets an appropriate upgrade, now being disguised as any other possible spawn in the area until it is battled. Which brings up the question of how to efficiently locate it. Well, there are a few tricks to this. First off, whenever you ZL target a Pokemon you haven't encountered, its name will show up as question marks. And thankfully, this holds true for any Mon Ditto transforms into that you've seen before, meaning one could encounter the most common Pokemon in the area, then scan through until a Ditto is found. But of course, even if we stick to just a single encounter for this, that eats up a bit of time we'd prefer not to waste. 
On the other hand, dittos in disguise don't actually mimic their targets perfectly, as they have a distinct tell we can utilize. Normally, Pokemon in the overworld will react when you pass by them, however a ditto in disguise will not, meaning all we would need to do is run by any of the spawns to see if they react, and if we find one that doesn't, it's a ditto. Now you do need to be careful, as any Pokemon that recently reacted will not do so again, but luckily if you were to get confused or can't seem to find a ditto, we have one more trick, as you can actually reload the area by stepping near the middle edge of the cliff and continue checking for reactions. There is another fun detail about finding ditto in these games though. If you save and quit with a disguised ditto loaded in, when you reopen the game, ditto will now be exposed. Obviously this is slower than our methods, but ditto will funnily de-transform into itself when battled. With that though, we can move on to the catch, and with ditto being at levels 28 or 29, we won't have a consistent way to lower its health. Thus, the number one item we need is a quick ball, which has a 28% shot to make the catch, and perfectly, there is one along our path, just after passing the windmills next to a boulder. Alongside this, playing at night for dusk balls would be our best bet. However, we are locked in today until finishing this tutorial, making our next best option three Ultra Balls along our way, which have a 14% chance per throw. So once we finally make it over to West Prov Area 2, we start watching for each Pokemon's reaction as we head to the cliff until eventually finding our Faker, making sure to save since the catch is far from favorable. But then, after missing another Quick Ball, we luckily make the catch in an Ultra, ending our final run without too much transforming trouble. So that wraps up the most transformative trials we've tackled yet, taking a total time of 26 hours, 11 minutes, and 27 seconds, slotting safely in as our second longest challenge to date by over 12 hours. So if you enjoyed, liking and subscribing always helps a ton. Oh, and if you want to see that longest challenge in the series, go check out the legendary video here, or the entire series playlist, as we have done quite a lot across the past year. As always, I would love to hear what you thought down below and what you would like to see next. I have an idea for what episode could fit well for the upcoming season, but there are a lot of projects I am excited to continue working on too. Until then though, thanks so much for watching, and more to come soon.